Hello folks and welcome back to World War II TV and we are halfway through Arnhem week and we are talking about the Polish route to Arnhem so not necessarily much about the battle itself although of course it will come up more about how they got there and about their incredibly famous commander and um, so that's how we're going to go off well you all know who my guest is going to be tonight because she's been on several previous World War II shows uh, Jenny Grant is joining us. She has got a bit of a cold, so if she if she coughs and sputters, we'll just have to forget about that. But she's at least gracing us with her presence today, so that's really cool. So, um, good evening, Jenny. I won't ask how you're doing because we know how you're doing. You've got a bit of a cough, but got um, the hot water. Got the hot water. So, General Sosabowski, the polls. I mean, let's start because if you've been following me on Twitter, folks. It's been an interesting weekend. The discussion of inclusivity and and wokeness. I hate that word has come up. But what I think something you pointed out and before we get into Arnhem and the polls is that it, this was something that was being discussed at a high level in World War Two about making the Polish troops in Britain feeling that they were part of a wider force. So just explain a bit more about that, because I think it's really fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, the, there is nothing inevitable about the defeated and sort of military of one particular country coming and serving under the command of, of another country. Um, and yet we see, I mean, by the end of the war, you've got quarter of a million um, sort of Polish servicemen and women under British command. Um, first up, you have the Navy, um, who sort of integrate beautifully and actually are then seen as a sort of model, you know, Although you've got plenty of sort of intelligence reports on the state of, for example, the Polish Air Force that passed through the Air Ministry and so forth, that intelligence doesn't seem to actually make it through to the front lines. Um, so they're kind of basing their decisions very much on the polls in front of them as they arrive. Um, and you've always got this tension then between the polls, why are they fielding a military? On an individual basis, the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, they want to continue the fight. They've seen their country occupy. They've left their family to sort of take that to Germany. Um, politically, um, the military is almost, it, it is the state incarnate. Once Poland disappears off the map, gosh, uh, once Poland disappears off the map, um, the military is the constant diplomatic geopolitical reminder that there was a Poland and that it deserves to have its independence once we get to the end of the peace talks. Um, so it needs to perform well. It needs to sort of justify, you know, sort of taking Poland seriously. Um, but it is basically an extension of diplomacy. Um, and we see um, certainly, you know, if you compare the Navy and the Air Force and the Army, um, each of those services, an evolution of attitudes um, by the British and the Poles towards each other, because there will always be this tension that their strategic objectives are never quite aligned. Defeat of Germany, they can unite over. Um, but how much Polish um, independence you should have for each service, um, how much the British should use it as a wing of their um, sort of military effort, that's something that we see throughout being sort of renegotiated. Um, and as I say, when we, we talk about, you know, the Poles in Britain, um, obviously it's not just the Poles. You have the Czechs, the Belgians, Norwegians, Yugoslavians. Um, you know, in Battle of Britain, there are six other um, Allied Air Forces um, sort of playing a role. Sorry, not Air Forces, but, but Air Men um, playing a role. And this isn't us sort of transposing some sort of woke agenda going, oh, but the Poles were there too. This was commented on actively. The BBC would play the, the airs of the Allies. They would play national anthems or, or national songs um, each evening. It was a real celebration. And what you then see at the end of the war is the British getting very, very sensitive to America trying to rewrite history. You know, a lot of their accounts, even coming from Normandy, are focused on the Americans. Um, and they begin to sort of up the extent to which it was a British effort to the exclusion of the Allies. Um, and that's particularly tragic when you get, for example, all of these Poles arriving that have passed through Siberia, through the Polish Second Corps, settle in Britain. And they're coming at a time when there's active hostility towards the Poles, the idea that they should go home. You have news reports um, counting the number of empty seats on the ships sailing to Poland. Poles go home was a campaign. So, um, you know, when we talk about people like my family sort of settling, there is, you know, this, this sense that they'd, they'd come for money. It wasn't that, you know, Yalta had given away their homeland, uh, that there's nowhere to go back to, and um, that they had come through these, these labour camps with a sort of 50% uh, mortality rate. Um, 
so yeah when, when, I, when I get slightly you know sort of passionate about you know acknowledgement of the Polish contribution it's because really we're sort of fighting this sense that the, the British alone myth and um, that established really very soon after and um, the the end of the war I mean essentially what we're saying is these are not new topics they're topics that have been going around and 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 who feels um what place within a, within something that about it but we are the goal is to talk about it and and then getting sidetracked into discussions of whether it's inclusive or not is is we're missing the point of the fact that we're we're stronger together but anyway enough of that of mm -hmm. that subject but it's interesting that it has come up so let's talk about well what we're meant to be talking about so arnhem so everybody has seen a bridge too far everybody knows the gene hackman portrayal of general sosabowski which is is what it is and um that everyone has an opinion about about the polish role in arnold we're going to expand on that and talk about his career before that perhaps look at how you've um looked at it from a from a particularly polish point of view because he is he's an outsider in that sense within the establishment um so th this is it we'll start with this this is your powerpoint you've you've provided this so there's a couple, this, this is a really fascinating quote. So I'll, 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 as you've got the saw for it, I'll read that out there and then I'll let you expand on it. So this is a quote that Jenny has found there. So I impressed upon my commanders and told them to impress it also upon their men that this operation would not be a picnic. In spite of British assurances and intelligence reports to the contrary, I expected hard and bitter fighting. Now, when did he write that? And who was it aimed at? Right. So, I mean, Sosabovsk is really interesting um, as a sort of... Um, example of somebody who actually does manage to shape his own legacy and, and how he's remembered. So there was a book came out re relatively recently called Poland's Forgotten Generals. And yes, Sosobowski, like Maciek or Bor Komorowski, um, or, or any of these, was reduced to a fairly sort of manual job after the war. But Sosobowski comes out fighting and he um, produces a number of books um, where he sort of gives the Polish perspective. And this was kind of one, one of the things I wanted to sort of follow up on was, um, we had this sort of um, debate on social media about, you know, the Poles are, are white, you know, written out of British military history. Either they're literally not in, you know, books written on the campaigns in Normandy, um, or they're, but they, they misspell names, um, or they include them and then they sort of go, in, oh, and we, we, you know, represented their contribution we said they were brave and so forth but they never really come at it from a polish perspective so sosobowski is really interesting that he manages actually to control his legacy so although he died so he writes sorry your original point was this comes from um the book that he wrote um was published in 1960 um and, and i've put it on the, the sort of the next slide um which is freely i served um it's, it's one of the, about four books um that he writes and um this was this idea that Operation Market Garden, he's responding to other memoirs being written by, for example, Urquhart and, and so forth. Um, this idea that Operation Market Garden, although we can see the value and, and the vision behind it, um, was let down by a number of, of failures um, at an operational level, at a tactical level. Um, and he comes out and so, and this was actually, you know, reviewed in the press in 1960. He dies in 1967. Um, you know, yes, he's you know sort of sort of a humble. Um, you know, he's working in a, a workshop, um, but then we get 1977 and we got a bridge too far. And actually, the portrayal of Sosabowski is is pretty accurate in that he was up in everybody's face, pointing out the errors um, throughout. And yes, this doesn't make him popular. Um, and you know his his account then of, of why he's removed um, from his position. Um, he talks about December the first heard that Browning had written um, to Sir Ronald Weeks, deputy chief of the Imperial General Staff, suggesting I should be removed from my command. Which is really interesting because why on earth would the British have any say in the the Polish um, you know sort of command structure? Um, but obviously there's diplomatic relations and if you've got bad relations with the British War Office, then that's going to impact everything else. Um, so he's, he's sort of, you know, the Poles kind of edge him out as well. It's, it's, it's not just the British. Um, the main reason that he gave was that I was too difficult to collaborate with, um, which again is really interesting because this is December 1944. Um, the, the parachute brigade doesn't really play much more of a role um, from, from then on. Um, 
But then he says, I never looked upon my dismissal as a defeat. I considered it a moral victory. So Solzhenitsyn gets to write his own legacy compared to, say, as we said, Maciek or Borkomorowski. The idea of him standing up and, and defending his men in the face of what he thinks was poor decision is, I think, a legacy he'd be pretty happy with. Yeah, that that makes sense. And and, and there's there's the yeah you know, talking about his own book there. And it's you know, nineteen sixty is is uh, uh, fresh enough after war for it not to be so far in the past. He's he's misremembering it. And it as as you say, it is in the era when lots of people are putting their books out and and kind of getting their versions across. And and we know the main players. And it's not just the books, but it's they're doing the speaking tours, they're doing the Sandhurst thing, they're doing the battlefield tours, and Colonel Frost and 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 Urquhart and and many others are. Are getting their their opinions across because it's already not quite the level it is today, where it's still debated by armchair historians. But there had been these questions about how it had been wrong and a bit of finger pointing since since sort of forty four or forty five, and and you know, the the Polish had had been because they were the outsiders had been an easy target in some respect to to, to put some criticism at. Although if anyone knows anything about the plan, everything they do. They do pretty well, uh, from my point. But we'll, we'll go back. Let's go back to the to the beginning because interesting character. And then we'll come back to Market Garden later on. So I'll hand over to you. And if you need a cough break, just let me know, and I'll I'll, I'll try and fill in without you. But um, we're, guess, we're all looking forward to this. And again, thanks everybody for watching. There's a lot, lots of lots of people to here today, which is really good. And I hope you enjoyed the show, the live show from Ireland yesterday with Neil and Edwin, because that was lots of fun to do. And um, um, but yeah, back back to you, Jenny. And let's talk about his early life. Yeah, so I, I, I was thinking about this. I, I think I may be the sort of Christopher Nolan of Polish military history. I do the backstories, don't they? I the origin stories. Um, so if we take Sosabowski out, I mean, you've indulged me a little bit because, I mean, I mean you know, know my fondness for Maciek. Um, but there is a, a point to this. Um, if you look at the sort of little red um, point, um, so this is Stanisławów, um, which is... Ooh, that was quite fancy, wasn't it, Paul? Um, so this is Stanisławów, um, which is just sort of southeast of, of Watch. You can see in the sort of top left of the picture. Um, so he, he's born in this city um, that's relatively close to sort of the Polish border. And Maciek's born not very far away um, in, oh, my gosh, um, Szczerzec. Um, in fact, Maciek's wife comes um, from there. The best people come from Lwów, including my grandfather. Um, <laughs> And he is born into not quite poverty, but his father dies relatively young. And his memoir very much focuses on he's the eldest son and he has to take responsibility for the family's finances. Um, he starts tutoring other students. He shows a huge amount of initiative in sort of taking that on. Um, but he says he doesn't have, you know, he, he's lining his boots with cardboard. He doesn't have a coat, so he runs everywhere. Um, he's reading through the other kids' textbooks. Um, during break time. So he's incredibly self-reliant, but again, without getting into the sort of the cod psychology element, he has to learn very early on that he can depend on nobody else. Um, compared to say Maciek then, who's born into this sort of relatively privileged family, the sort of legal background, he goes off to Lvov University and he studies, you know, um, yeah, was a sort of philology and then so forth and wants an academic career. This isn't something that's open um, to Sosabowski. He, he, you know, graduates from high school very well. Um, and then he does a sort of uh, commercial course um, at Krakow because the money isn't there for him to go to university. Um, and the military is not really an option because when we're talking about this, uh, this is pre-war. Mm -hmm. pipes are the best rad as they are. Um, when we're talking about... Um, sort of pre-war. Poland is partitioned. There is no Poland. He's not born into Poland. He's born into the Austrian um, partition. Um, so I think he has to develop this fairly steely determination. Uh, he's, he's got a love of scouting and camping and, and so forth. But I do think there's a degree of hurt that accrues when you make that decision that you, it's on you. And although he's professionally successful, he marries, his, his son becomes a doctor and so forth. I do think there's that vulnerability where he never quite understands when he's been politically, sorry, when he's been very assertive, 
why that sometimes backfires on him. And he, he makes it sort of a, a matter of pride. I, I do think there's a sort of adjustment issue there. As I say, I'm trying to avoid the cos psychology, but um, that is kind of the character he creates. He starts his memoirs by saying, you know, that I was always being told, you know, to, to you know, I had to, you know, watch my tongue at the next stage. And he's saying, but actually, I think it's, you know, but this is good leadership. You should call out um, uh, the orders um, if you think they're wrong. Um, and, and politically, that, that does kind of end it for him um, in 1944. Um, so yeah, during the war, then um, he has a sort of double life. Um, he he starts off as a bank clerk, which is a relatively good profession with you know sort of promotional opportunities um, for a man without a degree um, in Poland. Um, but on the side, he's got this sort of secret double life where he's very active in the scouting movement and, and the rifles, this underground movement set up by Pilsudski. Um, so he's sort of developing his sort of leadership skills and the, the sort of the military skills through um, this, while at the same time sort of um, earning his money as a bank clerk. And then the war comes and like Maciek, he's um, drafted into uh, the, the Austro-Hungarian army. Um, and his accounts really interesting of this period. Um, he's promoted relatively rapidly, but um, you know, the Austrian um, war effort, he's at the siege of um, Przemysl. So I'm saying that so badly, I apologise. Um, but um, he's talking about, um, he's really concerned with things like um, field kitchens not developing, d delivering food, coats not delivering food, the arbitrary justice that's meted out as they're retreating and people being sort of hanged um, on, on a whim effectively. Um, and he says, you know, but it's also as a promote as he's promoted steadily, um, he's learning his leadership skills. And the key things he takes is in this fairly miserable position, how do you get the best out of your men? And he says you lead by example, and um, you are the one at the front enduring the hardships with them. Um, and then after the war, he then stays with the military. Um, but he's got nothing to do, and I'll be talking about the sort of development of parachuting he's got absolutely nothing to do with that he's, he's, he's primarily sort of working his way through the infantry um he becomes a lecturer at, at the military academy um but he's mainly focused on things like supplies and logistics he writes he gets an award for writing a book about um quartermasters in the field which sounds riveting um and then he's um yeah so, so that's kind of the role that that's being taken by him um, and then he's appointed um, just on the eve of war uh, to the 21st Children of Warsaw Infantry Regiment. And that's where he is when the war breaks out. Um, we look then, as I say, at um, sort of parachuting in pre-war Poland. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because I think it's, a lot, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot more advanced than where Britain was at the time. Um, so aviation sports generally is this massive craze in pre-war Poland. Um, you have, for example, the, the balloon races, the Gordon Bennett Cup is run by um, Polish aviators three years in a row. And um, you have, for example, Warsaw to Tokyo, um, really sort of inspiring uh, sort of young men. The government invests in sort of these aero clubs for gliding um, and so forth. So you've got a picture at the top left there um, of a parachutist, um, on a plane at an air show so this sort of idea of leaping from plane was you know it's part of a spectacle and then as we move through the sort of um later 30s and um, we get the military developing an interest in in parachuting and actually you have a parachuting training center set up at Bidgosch and um, so that the tower on the right is their parachute training um tower um, and they're learning how to do all the things that we naturally associate um with um paratroops you know they're going and sort of destroying communications and, and so forth um so you've got the, those trials and they're actually i think it's, it's either 16 or 18 such towers across poland it was a real sort of um you know source of enthusiasm and then you've also got people um like this chop up chap chop chap on the left um who is um julian and um, Gemboish, um, um, again, um, and he um, is part of the, the train centre in Bidgosh, and he will actually go on and, and work at RAF Ringway um, when we get into sort of 39-40. Um, so there's quite a big focus on this, but it's only really taken off um, in its infancy from a military perspective as we get into sort of 39, um, and then the war comes and kind of ends or all, all of that and it doesn't look like you know this this will play any further role um obviously you know the army of occupation you can't really be using paratroopers um so 
yeah so this is kind of where we, we get to um, so just, just to recap and give you a break for your voice for a couple of seconds is that we're at the point where he's already shown the ingredients of being a very capable commander because he's got that kind of independent streak because he's been he's been he's needed to be the the set the provider for his family because of his father's death he's been both kind of inside and outside because he's working in a bank but also doing this sort of military course in the, at the same time clearly got a mastery of logistics and that i think is is a big um reason why he has insight into the market garden because there are people who look at the market garden plan solely from the view of a paratrooper or air commander he's got more of a broader kind of ground up and air down view of it, which maybe means he can see it for for what it is, uh, and then in you know good solid infantry training, which which you need. Um, so you know he's got all the ingredients to be a very capable commander. So I think that that leads us nicely to sort of where we're getting with World War II. And you're right about uh, for me the Polish are sort of borrowing a little bit of what the Russians are doing with developing parachuting and that same type of thing. They're kind of the shared sort of idea of deep war and it starts off as sort of, a, as you say, a, an adventuring kind of thing, but then it rapidly gets identified as being something that can be used within a, a military context. But um, yeah, but we're now, now, now Poland, of course, is, is, is not so much thrust into World War II. World War II starts in Poland for those in Europe. So, you know, he, he, he's at the center of everything. So I'll hand back to you. Hopefully you've recovered Bit of sip of water there. Back back to you, Jenny. Thank you. Oh, you think it's water? How sweet. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, one of the interesting things. I mean, if you follow magic through, you follow a lot of the airmen through, is that they're in a state of retreat relatively early on. Um, when we get to Sosabowski, he's absolutely the heart of the defence of Warsaw. Um, to begin with, it's sort of modelling fortress, which is, is like the Polish Verdun, for example, um, strategically. Um, and then he's actually sort of defending Warsaw itself. Um, so he is, you know, he moves his HQ to an abattoir. He is sort of, you know, witness to... Um, what, one of the scenes that really stays with me is as they're approaching Warsaw and the sort of the sky is lit up um, and it's sort of glowing red and they can't work out what's different. And they notice that a lot of the church spires, which had just been familiar, have have disappeared. You know, the whole of, of the, the sort of um, the, the, the cityscape has, has changed. Um, there's a shortage of water. You have families living in cellars. And although there is. I mean, one of the interesting things is that Warsaw, Poland generally, is so much hotter on civil defence than, say, Britain. Um, you know, you've got Red Cross prepped on how to deal with gas attacks. You have an um, expectation that new buildings will be built with gas proof rooms. You have regular um, sort of um, drills, um, you know, simulating an air attack, um, for example. Um, so when Warsaw starts to be bombed, uh, the people aren't stultified by this they actually go into action they start building these defensive trenches and, and so forth so he's kind of there while they're building barricades to prevent the sort of the german defense um german offensive sorry um and he's sort of reacquainted with with his um his wife and, and his son um and this lion that they adopt a lion cub i love the poles in this in the middle of all of this horror they adopt a lion cub that um, from the zoo and, and, and feed it but then he's given this this position of basically trying to set up um, underground networks. Um, so he travels to uh, Lvov, to Lublin and, and so forth, trying to see who are the sort of the leading individuals who can help sort of coordinate this. Um, and it's a time when he has to go and obviously he's, he's undercover. He can't give his true name. So he has to register for work deployment. Um, you know, the, the, the Germans are in control fairly rapidly. Um, and he's traveling around Poland and gets an awareness of what this actually means for, for the Polish people. And then eventually he's tasked with crossing out of um, Poland and, and trying to um, sort of uh, make contact with Sikorsky in Paris. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of descriptions of the horrors visited um, is something that's very, very sort of um, visceral. And, and we kind of, you know, forget about the degree of trauma. I mean, these people, I mean, all of them make reference to, you know, sort of, abandoned prams with you know prams tipped over with legs 
you know, sort of sticking out and, and so forth. And, you know, when, when they leave Poland, they are leaving families behind. Um, and I, I do think that's an element that, that's, that's kind of forgotten of, of how traumatic this must be for, you know, most of these men haven't seen combat, um, you know, certainly the younger men. So this is occupied Poland. And then he reaches France, um, which I think is the next slide. Um, and, just, and just to interrupt you, I think, I think it is fair to say that when we're talking about the 1939, 1940 period in countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia and even France, is that, that for all the fighting, there are also officers in those armies who end up being out of the fight before they have even had a chance to see any combat because of just the way things go. And, and, and I think, to me, the fact that Sozabowski is so absolutely involved in the defence of, of, of Warsaw and, and this, this desperate situation seals the deal for him that he's never going to be anything other than a Pole, wherever he ends up, whoever he's serving with. Now, with, with other uh, um, of our allies who end up becoming part of the British organised or American forces, they kind of give themselves over to, like, to like the new system and they become part of... Uh, Part of, I'm thinking of some of the people, some of the pilots and things in the air force who become, they're they're still French, they're still Czech, they're still Polish, they're still whatever. They become part of the new system, and they're still very proud of their of their of their background. But they they make it, they make their career by becoming part of this new thing. Sozabowski is fiercely and only ever going to be Polish. Kind of, for me, it seems he's only ever kind of on attachment to the British. And I think to me, it's that 1939-40 period that seals that. He's he's Polish first, uh, allied second, whereas some some others may be allied first and their own country second. Is that a fair comment? And, and I, I would say I would absolutely agree. Um, but I don't think it's Sosabowski alone. I mean, Poland's regained its independence in 1918. Um, you know, there's talk about, you know, you've had three generations of families having been deported to Siberia fighting for Polish independence. And the, the Poland that emerges um, in, you know, 1918, 1919 is building itself from the ground up. But it's got incredibly talented individuals giving themselves to the state. And this idea of service to the state, I think it's quite hard for us. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's talking about this real patriotism and, and, and love of country and country above all. I mean, uh, you know, this idea of, you know, loved a man sacrificing something. I mean, that was, you know, it was country above family, country above safety, country above, you know, career advancement. Um, so the Poles were absolutely sort of, you know, committed to this. And when they come to Britain, and this actually links in quite nicely, they hadn't intended to come to Britain for the most part. Their aim was in the first place to withdraw to the southeast, wait for the British and French to attack Germany from the west. They think that's still coming. That's their position. Hold out long enough and then they can attack um, from that from that direction. When that doesn't happen, they cross the border once Russia comes and, and Poland's fate sealed. Um, but then for the most part, apart from the Air Force, which is pretty desperate to get to Britain because they rate its planes better, they think you know, it's got more resources, they will re regroup in France. Um, and then they will just add to the bulk of the French, who will then eventually, you know, they're, they're their ally, will then attack Germany. So that's never out of, of focus. That's always their priority is for that to happen. Um, that said, when they get to France, now Sosabowski refers to it as the French interlude, um, but obviously when they arrive in France, that is the new normal. They have to make the best of that situation. So they develop their divisions and, and their training camps and so forth. Um, but what you do have, and this is, you know, in, in all of memoirs, is this real sort of collapse of morale that the French don't value them. They they blame the Poles for their defeat. They blame the Poles for then consequently dragging France into this conflict that they never really were that committed to. Um, the resources that they're provided with are are poor. And you think about, you know, sort of um, Kuwaitan, um in Brittany. And, you know, there's, there's not windows, you know, glass in the windows. And there's not leather provided for their boots. And, you know, they're given rifles. I mean, Sosabowski goes a little bit. He's talking about, you know, sort of rifles from, I think, the Franco-Prussian War, for example, being provided. Um, and this isn't all that France could offer. When we get to May 1940, suddenly the sort of the doors are opened and the, the, the Polish divisions are given um, this. You know, think about Maciek sort of suddenly gets his hands on tanks rather than this sort of FTs, uh, the Renault FTs. Um, 
so yeah, it's quite dispiriting. So he's put in charge of the, um, I think it's the first Grenadier Division. Um, and then just before war breaks out, he's transferred to the fourth division in the hope of sort of building up an, another um, sort of Polish unit, which means that when it's the fall of France, he's away um, from the front line. Um, and then you get Operation Aerial kicks in. I mean, this is kind of one of the tragedies with, with 1914 is that Sikorsky agrees to support the French in their retreat. And as a result, he loses three quarters of the Polish army in France. Um, <coughs> some of that is because a lot of that was um, French born um, Polish volunteers who kind of peel back to their families. But a lot of it, for example, you know, end up interned in Switzerland or in German POW camps. So, forth. so only a quarter um, escape through. Um, and then you've got that moment where they go to um, Britain and um, through Operation Ariel on a ship that takes much longer than it should. I think there's 3,500 people on um, the, the older pool and arrive in, in Plymouth. And, and this is where Poland, they have to regroup yet again. Um, so Sosabowski's, you know, he's, he's had to deal with invasion. He's had to sort of reform his unit a number of times in Warsaw. He's had to escape. He doesn't want to leave. I mean, that's one of the crucial things. He's desperate not to leave Poland, but he follows his orders to go to France and then asks to be returned back and, and, and they refuse. Um, so then we get, once he, he's there, we see this evolution then of what will become the Parachute Brigade. So um, August 1940, Sosabowski is very clever in that while you're kind of regrouping, you want to show initiative in making yourself valuable um, so that you get access to resources and training. So he says, right, we'll, we'll form this um, cadre brigade um, and it will, you know, the idea is to train up all these Canadian volunteers that, that never really materialise. So by August 1940, then he's up in Scotland and it becomes a fourth officer's cadre brigade. Um, October 1940, then, uh, they moved to Fife and are engaged in building the anti-invasion defences. Um, and then it's not until you get to sort of February 1941 then that a few of his men uh, offer the opportunity to go to, to Ringway near Manchester to do a sort of parachute training course. Um, and this kind of gives them an idea of where he could make a difference. Um, there'd already been talk in France of Sikorsky of trying to get supplies and information between uh, France and occupied Poland. Um, but the French don't give them the planes to actually sort of complete that sort of journey. But he says, we, we could do this um, and we could go and we could actually support the future uprising that we, we want to come. So um, he sort of takes this idea um, and sort of develops it. So when we get then, you know, this period between sort of February and September um, 1941, you see the evolution then into the first Polish independent parachute brigade then being officially recognised. And in that time, he's kind of secured access because it's really difficult. I mean, obviously, it's, you know, a parachute brigade is hugely dependent on goodwill with the other allies for access to all of its resources. Um, although we'll look in a minute about how the sort of Poles show initiative on that front. 1942-44, though, you've got this ongoing debate. The Poles, this is the only element of the, the Polish armed forces that has that word independent in there, that it is purely under Polish command. And the British keep trying to sort of get the little claws in and say, well, we, we'd like access to this. And the Poles are like, well, no, th this, is, this is ours and it is purely for operations in Poland. Um, although you see a few of them sort of being effectively agree that yes they the poles can be used under british command and they can be used um outside of poland and, and, and in france in particular i think this is a really important thing to just to, to just backpedal a little bit is that they you know, they are they've been together a long time because when we think about the british airborne forces there are little little cliques of groups from former regiments, but it was it was volunteers. Volunteers came to join the new fangled parachute troops, as as did mostly happen in the USA as well. So people came from other pre-existing infantry units. But the Poles have most of them have been together a long time. And the fact that I'm really glad you you, you made it clear that they they envisage, envisage themselves as being something to actually go back and specifically be involved in in the liberation of attacking of 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 their mother country of Poland itself, and and that I think is in, in that that's their primary focus, and they relax that standard because, well, I'll let you kind of explain why they relax that standard because 
you know, who, who persuades whom? You just said there that when the, that they agree to be um, to do things under British command. The pressure comes from where, or do they see it as a mutually kind of beneficial relationship? Because they haven't done anything yet. They've not. They've not. Is it because they feel that there's get more of an opportunity to do something with the British? What's your take on why they allow that kind of um, changeover? Essentially, it's supposed to be a a tit for tat that temporarily the poles will pass under British command for this particular operation, but after that the British will commit to supporting the Poles and providing them with the planes to then go back to Poland. And um, that's the deal. Um, and it becomes a sort of brinkmanship thing. And, and Sosbowski talks about, you know, he's, he's talking this through. And effectively, it's maybe we'll get to the end of the war. And if we say no, we won't have seen action either um, on the Western Front or in Poland um, itself. So there's a huge... And it's that kind of um, disparity um, in the sort of... Uh, you know, the relationship between the Brits and the Poles. The Poles are an exiled army. They are absolutely dependent on um, the British for everything from rifles to uniforms and certainly to access to, to planes. I mean, that's not something you can, you know, develop from your own initiative. Um, so, yeah, th th that's kind of where it's coming from. I mean, and I think that's a good point. The fact that, that they can have all the um, ambition as they, and they want, but they will need to be armed by what is in the British Isles. And that's going to be British rifles, British uniforms, British this. Someone just asked, well, Kevin Jones just asked, and this, this, we can expand this to include the armoured division as well, how many Poles fled to the UK. And now that's a very, very large, because that would include all sorts of people, including refugees and civilians. But in terms of, of the airborne forces that we're talking about and Matchex division, what, what's the number, do you think? Um, by the time you get to 1944, and that will then include... Um, I'm, I'm going to pick apart the word fled there. I'm going to talk about... <laughs> the and yes, yeah, thing. yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, you've got roughly 16,000 um you've got those who escape from france you've got a very small number of volunteers who come from america and canada and, and south america from the sort of polish communities there you've got a huge number of recruits increasingly that have come from um the middle east from the polish second corps um because they're always short of recruits. I mean, Sosabowski goes on continuously about um, that there's a negotiation about how many casualties, you know, are required before the, the brigade is taken out of the front line. And because they don't have the reserves, and he said it takes six months to train somebody up. So they're receiving men from, um, you know, who passed through Siberia, and a lot of them are still um, in very sort of poor health. Um, but yeah, about 16,000. When we get to the end of the war, we end up with about 125,000 Poles plus families settling. Um, but that bulk has come from the Polish Second Corps that's passed through the Italian yeah. campaign. Um, but during wartime Britain, you know, there are presents, absolutely, but, but you know, far less so than there will be in the post-war period. Yeah. So, um, so we're at the point where they've they've agreed they will they will go under British command, which is kind of leading us up to the to the to the market garden side of things but i'll hand back to you for that because there were other possibilities of what could happen we discussed um with james daly a few weeks ago all the cancel plan between market uh, between uh, overlord and market garden um what possible other things might have the po the polls done at this period you know once once they agree so let's let's take us from march to september i know you've got the bullet points there on the on the powerpoint but run us through sort of march to september yeah so march to september then um as I say, the negotiations are ongoing and um, they begin to have a lot more sort of resources um, released to them once they decide to sort of commit to to being used um, by the British. Um, they then move away from sort of Scotland. Um, they've been doing things like loads of training around Salisbury Plain, for example. Um, they moved to the Stamford area. Um, and then, and, and this is, you know, like just the absolute bitterest irony, um, Whatever your views on the wars are uprising and the post-war generals are absolutely split on whether it was um, this absolute, you know, sort of sacrifice. It was what was absolutely essential to keep Poland in the mind of the world um, when they were being so-called liberated by the Soviet Union or whether it was a huge miscalculation um, based on the idea of air support that was never going to come. Um, but whatever, the, the, the link between this brigade and Warsaw is absolutely crucial. I mean, mm. 
So, for example, there's this standard made, um, and this is actually requested by, by the, the, the polls in Britain, and that they will have their own standard made by the people of Warsaw. Um, so they put, and this is um, Madalinska, who ha, was the woman in, in Warsaw who made all of these standards, and, and they find this sort of 18th century robe, and, and they use all the sort of embroidery, gold embroidery thread, and they make this, and they smuggle it back and so forth. And it's then presented by the people of Warsaw to the parachute brigade um, and basically they're, they're expected to take this oath that they will fight for war so that this is what it means and so the bit where it gets to August 1944 and the Brits from the Polish perspective make no effort to sort of send this brigade through to support the uprising and when that was pretty much the only reason that they'd come together um, is absolutely devastating for them. Um, and that sort of sense of impotence, you know, magic's involved in Normandy, um, they're about to go, you know, the, the sort of, you know, they're sort of kicking their heels and, and in Britain, the, the brigades, um, and they can't contribute in any meaningful sense, it's, it's really heartrending. Um, and then we get then in September, um, sorry, I'm just reading. Um, yeah, I just want to put that before we get to September, oh. because... I think, you know, you addressed the, the complications of we're talking about the uprising itself, but of course the complications of whether or not you could send in an independent parachute brigade and what they may or may not be able to achieve and whether they could be reinforced. There's there's lots of variables to that whole issue there. But, the, the, you know, the, I mean, that, that the way Chris worded it there, logistically impossible. It, what's your interpretation of, of could they have done something if they'd gone there? The fact of whether they want to go is neither here nor there for the second. What could they have done if they had gone there? Or would it have been more in the kind of the noble sacrifice to make a statement kind of idea? Well, the thing is, it fails, doesn't it? I mean, you know, we have Yalta six months later. So although it's a noble sacrifice, um, it, it doesn't work in persuading the world. Um and that's partly because it is really problematic. I mean, you look at the sort of General Reisky, uh, for example, who's commander of the Polish Air Force. I mean, or Anders are hugely critical of the decision to launch the Warsaw Uprising. Um, you can send, you know, bombers from Italian bases. You really need Soviet bases then, but Stalin's not forthcoming. And then the losses endured by this sort of the Warsaw Bridge and, and, and this, you know, the, you know, the flying over occupied Europe during the daytime is, is staggering. Um, you know, I, I can't remember quite what proportion of the supplies they drop actually reach um, uh, Warsaw uh, civilians. But um, no, but in his memoirs, Sospotsky doesn't engage with that question at all. That, that that was what they were created for. It was up to the British really to find a way to make that happen. They were the allies. This, this was the deal that they had struck. Yeah, and I think ultimately there's just, there are too many variables with, with, with that situation. The what-if scenarios, the counterintuitives with regards to if they'd done this, because you then have the what what might the Russians have done outside the city, what might have happened there. There, there are too many different ways that could pan out. So we have to just accept the fact it went the way it did. The uprising didn't last more. Well, you know, Alina would agree, disagree and say in some places it carried on longer, but, you know, fundamentally it, it runs out of steam very very quickly and and so it's a moot point but there's, there's no point going down as interesting as this rabbit hole is to discuss the what ifs of this it's 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 too many variables so let's let's move up to september but what i think is interesting to, to just leave the warsaw uprising behind is that is that that, that we've talked about this when you came on and talked about magic is that every the poles within the brigade now have something in their minds beyond just the overall war effort they have warsaw and what's happened there firmly in their psyche there it's going to have an, a, an effect on their morale both in a positive and a negative way but you know is there anything that sozmovsky writes about the morale of his men coming out of that although they weren't involved in that rising but how they felt about it seeing it and hearing about it from from britain yeah, I mean, he, he literally that he ends a chapter cliffhanger of going, we make this decision to pass into British command just when the Warsaw Uprising breaks out. And that was the reason we've been created and we are powerless in that position. Uh, now, realistically, they would have been powerless regardless. Um, you know, they need the British to provide those those planes. Um, but yes, it's going to have an impact. But that was always the case. I mean, I, I've talked about, you know, the, the military serving this aim of, you know, keeping Poland in everybody's minds. Um, 
But it's more than that. It's also an opportunity to build up an armed force that can then be the nucleus of the new Polish armed forces. So, you know, there's an expectation that when they keep all the ground crew and the engineers and the pilots trained on, you know, modern fighters, and modern bombers, that they will take those skills to Poland. And, and this is exactly the same, that the army, um, the Maciek division, the aim is that they will take those, those tanks, as, as the Czechs do, for example, and they will liberate their capital city with those. Um, so that's always the driving force. I mean, we see in Normandy when they cross the Seine and they, they you know, they, they um, name the bridge that it just says to Warsaw. It's the Warsaw Bridge mm -hmm. as a reminder yeah. that that's where they want their road to end. Um, so that's always the point. You know, nobody obviously knows that it's going to end in May 1945. They, they don't know that Yalta is coming up at this point. And they still think that this this is the beginning of, you know, Sosabowski talks about um, on the 21st of September, his, his feet hit, um, you know, the grass of, of Europe. And, and that's it. And you see the Maciek, you know, arriving in Aramanch, and they are back on mainland Europe. And that that is a huge motivating factor for them. Yeah, um, wherever they are, they're still, they're, all roads still lead to Warsaw effectively. And that's the way they're, they're playing it. That's the way they're adapting it. Okay, we're coming here, we're going there, but it doesn't matter where we start. Our goal is going to be the same. So, but we're, let's go back to your, your the, the wonderful PowerPoint you're given because you've got some in your photos here of the training and ringway and what they're getting up to and um so so or anything else you want to say kind of leading up to the market garden period I mean you put these photos yeah. in so I mean I'll, I'll, I'll race I mean these ones here um are just you know the the examples of the camp um that, that you know not necessarily that Sospos finds itself in they're actually billeted in in schools and in Glasgow when they arrive um but then they're intense and this is another um example when they the, of the polls thinking further ahead when it comes to air defenses is they're very very critical of the British um uh, idea of lining up the tents um, in the open and you know they would have camouflage tents they would scatter them under trees and, and so forth and um, so that that's one of the sort of criticisms he makes he's always reflecting on sort of the best practice between you know not just the, the British and the Polish but when he visits America which we will be talking about in a minute you know what the Americans are, are doing as well um, and we see them in the bottom right there sort of engaging these um, invasion uh, preparing the defenses um, but if we move on to the next slide if that's all right um, so this is Ringway. Um, I, I, I think there's a thesis to be written on, you know, um, Clement Attlee's experience um, at Ringway with the Polish Parachute Brigade sort of shaping his attitude. Maybe this is why they don't get invited to the victory parade, is um, gets to wear this dappy training helmet and all sorts. Um, I think one of the interesting things with Ringway is Sosopowski is of the opinion that the British are too... <coughs> Their training schedule is too risky. It, it causes too many injuries, um, that there shouldn't be as many actual jumps. So at Ringway, they've got a number of ways of training, for example. So um, one of them is, you know, literally just going up in a Whitley and, and drop falling out. Um, the other one, and I really love this, is using the barrage balloons. Now, I could, I wasn't sure of the, the copyright consideration. So this is a generic um, barrage balloon. But if you imagine underneath it, you have a sort of suspended um, basket with about sort of six to eight men in it with a hole in the middle. And then that's attached to a winch to a lorry. And you would climb into your basket and then the lorry would release the winch and, and you would climb up. Um, and then you would sort of jump out of that. Um, I was reading about Bessie as the original barrage balloon, and, and, and at some point she sort of escapes her moorings and reaches Coventry, which I just think is, sorry, completely irrelevant, but it tickled me. Um, so you've got this idea of actually training at Ringway, and Sosbowski's got a very good relationship with Morris Newnham, um, who's sort of, you know, in charge of the, the airborne um, training. Um, if we can just move on to the next one, then. Um, but they crucially want to sort of become a little bit more independent and take charge and be less less dependent on sort of British goodwill. Um, one of Sosbowski's big concerns there is developing and um, physical training. The men that come back to him from Ringway um, report that that was very, very strenuous. And, you know, the paratroopers have to be fitter, if anything, than the standard infantry. And um, so we get all these photos of them sort of, you know, standing here in the shots sort of doing these leaps. Um, lots and lots of them sort of doing, um, you know, just gymnastics, physical training effectively. Um, but crucially, if you can see, you've also got um, this tower that, that is built um, at Largo House. Um, and this is sort of scraped together from steel girders from goodness knows where. Um, and this is where they do the bulk of their training. Um, they do 
developed this place called Monkey Grove, um, which is basically this assault course. Um, so these are engineers at a sort of loose end who sort of put all their creativity into this. And they build um, a Polish parachute tower. And we think the first in Britain um, up in Scotland and um, for them to be, you know, to sort of climb to the top and then sort of release so that you can practice your descent and your roles and, and, and so forth. Um, so, yeah, if you move on to the next one, then. And that's interesting though, because there, there were other people in the war who did, who, who decided or, or, or put forward the idea is that the risks of parachute training, as you said, is that, that you are losing a certain number of people in training and that maybe it's better to just kind of just do one jump. They got to a point with training like certain other people who would go in with an airborne division, you know, I don't know, dentists, um, bottle washers, whatever, is if you have 50 of them and you train them to parachute jump, you might lose 10. So you might as well just do the one jump because you probably will, you might, you might lose a couple, but you're not going to lose 10. Is that's reverse logic about, about putting them through training. And, and in a sense, the, the, what you're training a parachuter to do, the, the, the parachute, parachuting is the means of delivery. It's actually the what you do on the ground is in many ways more important than the parachuting itself, which may be, in, in Sozabowski's case with the poles he has, he doesn't need to instill in them a sense of being better or special or an esprit de corps because they've got that because they want to go back home. Whereas perhaps even today with the parachute forces in various countries, the idea of us using airborne forces as conventional parachutes is maybe not what we're going to do. But the, the training of men to jump out of aircraft is still a good way of separating the wheat from the chaff. But maybe in the Polish case, they don't have to do that because they've already separate they've already got this motivation i don't quite know where i'm going with that before but it's no it's i mean it's interesting but i i think possibly the sort of the reverse is true in the sense of most country no no you, you were right you were right and um, in a sense that um the poles and um, other countries sort of need to persuade men to join the parachutes so you know you have parachute pay for example yeah exactly and you have extra status um the poles don't need to do that um but I don't think it's burning patriotism, is that Sosabowski says it's not going to be a, vo a volunteer basis. If you're already in my brigade, this officer's cadet brigade, then you are going to be jumping out of parachutes. Um, and then he does open it up to volunteers and request recruits and, and so forth. Um, and the pay does eventually come through. There is parachute pay. Um, but I, I think it's this wonderful um, phrase, you know, elsewhere in the army, you're given an order, you you follow it, this is it, you are in, in, in the parachute brigade, you jump out of a goddamn plane. Um, and, and then he comes out with a wonderful phrase, you know, why should it be only the brave that die, for example? Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of undermined it. So it's, yeah, it's a, it, this is, I mean, he's quite bloody minded, isn't he? Let's face it, um, you know. Um, but, he, he, you know, his men have his loyalty. There was this wonderful case where, um, he asks for some recruits and I think it's Cookiel and um, delivers it. Um, it's 100 NCOs, um, but it turns out most of them have got um, some sort of criminal record on the verge of being put in prison for the crimes. Um, and these these hard cases, like the Dirty Dozen, and then he persuades, um, you know, he wins them over um, and, and sort of, you know, makes them into, you know, I will tear up your your, your, your sheets, you know, just show me what you're worth, for example. So again, we, we see them, I think they stop in Scotland again, uh, sort of building pontoon bridges and sort of training with mortars. Um, he is a big believer in keeping men busy to keep morale high. So you also have, um, you know, sort of skiing training is laid on um, and so forth. And, 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 you know, even from the outset, when they have zero resources, it's right, we're going to do this, this long march and then you will be tired because he's very, very conscious. And we see this in British War Cabinet reports that they are monitoring the morale of these defeated armies. Um, mm. That's a potential political problem, um, you know, both short term in terms of sort of unrest, but long term in terms of British attitudes, the British population's attitudes um, to, to how the, these men are received. Um, so, yeah. Interesting stuff. But now you, you said we were going to do this earlier. So, you know, he, he's he's taking on board some of what the British are doing, but also adapting it, improving it and changing it when he sees fit. So that's his independent streak coming through again. He's agreed to work under British command. But again, it's sort of in a sense on his terms. But you said you know, that you dropped this uh, tantalizing thing that he also understands the American point of view. He, he gets some links from what the U.S. are doing. So, so what 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 does he learn from the U.S.A.? 
Yeah, so he um, he, he sails aboard the, the Queen Elizabeth. He's, he's, he's having this sort of luxurious trip uh, to America to kind of make connections with them and to to learn um, about you know that their techniques. So he's saying you know the British are still doing they're dropping relatively few men um, you know in, in their sticks, whereas he's looking at America where they're sort of doing these massed formation drops. Um, so he's, he's, he's a big fan of that. So he's, he's constantly saying. But one of the things that sort of strikes me is the lack of communication and sharing of tactical developments um, between America um, and Britain. Um, but you've also kind of got this link to um, the sort of the Polish Americans, um, which is quite an, a nice feature. I mean, I was talking a couple of days ago about <coughs> Alexander Zatonsky, um, who was born to Polish parents, Polish immigrant parents in America, moves to Canada, hope, comes to Britain hoping to join the Polish Air Force. Um, can't because the war breaks out and so joins the RAF in order to you know there's this real sense among certain groups not as many as Sikorsky hopes um among sort of young Polish men who do want to fight for but but the mother country effectively so you've got um Richard Tice um on the right there um who is American he doesn't speak Polish um he volunteers um, there's been a sort of a couple of sources I've read and Sosabowski's like, um, you know, I, I gave him the option of move, you know, it's like, why would you not join the Americans? You get pensions, you get pay, you get status and, and so forth. And he refuses. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of debate on, on why he, he does exactly. But yeah, he and he's, he, you know, then dies at, at Arnhem. I, I think he's the only American casualty at um, Ustabek. Um, again, apologies for pronouncing that wrong. Um, so yeah, the, the sort of the American link, um, as proof of the Polish spirit enduring um, in the immigrant population is really quite important. And a lot of the sort of memoir accounts, Maciek talks about that as, as well, encountering, you know, both Americans within um, his own, you know, division, but also out in the field in Normandy, that there's one guy who um, gets um, good, you know, a pass for three days, good behavior to go and spot a real Polish general, for example. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of the, the link there that he's, he's kind of, You've got the Polish American community, but you've also got this awareness that the British are not necessarily, you know, um, there are other ways of doing it. And he's, he's very impressed by by th how the Americans are approaching and um, the sort of the training um, and, and their idea of, you know, sort of th these bigger drops. So that's that is the yeah, the independent brigade. They might as well be independent. They are independent so they can take on their ideas from from other sources. But. Well, this has all been leading up, I guess, to, to where it all comes to a head. And the and people have already said in the sidebar, some of them, that really the only bit about his career they know is the Market Garden bit, and half of that they know from the movie. Um, and and this this is what's so interesting about your research because you you know you focus exclusively really on the Polish contribution and only kind of branching out when it is there to support your 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 sole interest in the in the Polish aspect of it. So you know what? What do the Polish think about Sosabowski? What? How? Where was his reputation there? When you look at Polish sources, how does he come out of Market Garden? How do you think he comes out of Market Garden? Because people watching this may already have an opinion, but I'm interested in what your opinion is. I'm interested in the opinion about the men of the brigade and what you've uncovered about this this whole situation and what you basically want to talk about with regards to this. The, the market garden, whatever you want to call it, fiasco, debacle, bridge too far, 90% successful, however we want to classify it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the sort of popular Polish sources, um, their treatment of Sosabowski, um by the British is kind of up there with Yalta as, as betrayal, as evidence of British arrogance, British duplicity, um, poor treatment you know it, it, it ties into that sort of late 44 early 45 um treatment of poland as as their first ally um as, as the sort of the poles and um, portray it um so yeah i mean sosabowski you know when we get to his memoirs he's got a sort of final section where it's, which is called personal reflections where you think what's the rest of the memoir been my friend because he's not exactly been holding back um but i think one of the things he's he's hurt above anything he talks about um his relationship with 
British commanders, uh, like like Browning, for example. Um, and he says, you know, that they, they, he thought they'd got on well. Um, you know, he, he talks here, you know, in spite of his nickname, Boy, I was surprised to find such a very young looking senior officer. He was impeccably dressed. His welcome was warm. We had a long and friendly talk about mutual problems. Um, I think what changes is that when he is part of the Polish Independent Parachute Brigade, he meets these men as equals and he's talking about Polish problems and mutual problems and so forth. Once he's under British campaign, under British command, that entire dynamic shifts. And I don't think he appreciates that his relationship that he had needs to shift. Um, you know, it's, it's not optional. Um, so um, he's actually he's talks about, I think, with Urquhart at one point that Urquhart, you know, was actually quite short with him. Um, and, and Urquhart should have considered the sort of man he was. And you think, well, that's, that's, that's quite touchy and sensitive, isn't it, really? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the next quote, then, if we can bring it up, um, you know, the whole of his memoir um, is directed at um, defending the Polish role and attacking the decisions and, and he comes up with you know a number of things i mean as you said there were so many planned operations before market garden um that and he didn't really like any of them and this in itself made him lose faith in market garden and when market garden sort of you know announced there nobody really believes that this is the one they think it's going to get cancelled by all the rest so and, and then you've got all this sort of you know the delays due to the weather for example where you know you've got the men ready to go and you know screwed their courage to the sticking place and, and so forth and then that sort of you know has to, to pass for another day or so um and then you know the final point he's talking about you know he can see certainly the value of arnhem you know the first question that comes to mind about arnhem is if all had gone well would the plan have worked he doesn't really answer that, um, but he's certainly like, I can see that, the, you know, that the idea of saving these thousands of lives, of bringing the war to an end would have been worthwhile. Um, but he just thinks on the ground, you know, he questions Urquhart's experience. Um, he talks about breakdown in communication at the highest level between Eisenhower and Montgomery. Um, he talks about, you know, the drop zones just being far too far from the bridges, for example. Um, he's really, you know, he's, he, you know, when we get to... Um, Market Garden, um, he's really critical of the fact that um, his brigade has been split up so significantly. So you end up with one element north of the river, the bulk of it south of the river. Um, and he's questioning, you know, why could these planes not just have dropped as one after the other? Um, and we could have sort of, you know, into a 36 hour period rather than a, a sort of over 72 hour period. Um, so there's lots that he picks apart. Um, but and the key point is he is shaping trying to shape opinion about his role there's a few bits that don't quite work so for example when he's talking about he had these concerns but you know it was the end of the meeting he didn't want to be the guy that made the meeting longer sort of element it's not quite as convincing as you think um but yeah absolutely very much he's comes out with um we did what we could with what we had um and then obviously the brigade um stays on the ground there and, and this is kind of it that it's Sosabowski who is singled out for um, demotion and for criticism. It's not the Poles themselves. I mean, they are um, there. There's a fantastic photograph of them um, on some sort of blown up uh, tiger, I think, um, just outside Arnhem, for example, when it's the, the one year anniversary. Um, so they kind of emerge um, with their honour intact, but it's, it's very much focused on Sosabowski as an individual. Um, and that must be incredibly hard to live with. And I think you read his memoirs, and it's kind of similar in tone to General Reisky, who was the commander of the Polish Air Force, um, who's removed in May 1939, has to sort of deal with the fact that, um, you know, the Polish Air Force is then blamed for, for the September campaign, um, is then basically ends up in prison because he decides to sort of, you know, launch this major cat. You know, he thinks that basically sort of October 1939 is the time to be, you know, picking apart why did the air campaign fail and he's lobbying politicians and so forth. But he never, you know, again, he's lacking that sort of political savviness. And there's that bitterness in both of those memoirs that's, that's really sort of hard to deal with, given everything these men had gone through. And, and this is this is the you know, I'm following a conversation on the sidebar as well, which are very interesting because he he's both interested in his own personal 
reputation coming out of it, but he's more concerned about the reputation of his men, which is not necessarily something we can level at some of the other commanders involved in it without naming names who are more interested in their own coming, their own coming out of it. And if they can shift the blame to anybody, whether it's their men or another commander, they're happy to do that. He, he is, it seems to me he's, he's independent, but he's all, he's fiercely loyal to his men. And, and he is a bit of a fool guy. You know, he, he, as you say, he's the only notable commander that comes out with any kind of demotion following market garden. Most others, in fact, go up the ladder, not down the ladder. Um, so it, it, it would therefore, if you don't know anything about the battle and you look at the careers of the commanders afterwards in seeing what happens to him, you might therefore draw the conclusion. Well, he must be one of the ones who who screwed up the bad. If he's if he's is the one who goes down. So, I mean, what did come up earlier was as how again. I, I think I asked it again, but we kind of went round a bit. His reputation today within Polish history, within Polish historians, what how do they perceive Market Garden as a, as an as an overall plan, and how does he come out of it now? And has that changed in the historiography since World War Two? With of course Poland going through many cultural and political changes itself over the last eight decades. But right now, 2021, is there interest in Market Garden of Poland and what's what's their feeling about Sosobowski? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as I say, it's, it's wrapped up in the betrayal narrative. He's one of the Poland's forgotten generals. Um, but when he, he dies in, um, did I say, 66, 67, his um, ashes are then taken to Warsaw um, and given a sort of full burial and so forth. So there's that degree of sort of not necessarily rehabilitation, it never really lo lost the love of the Poles, uh, which is quite entertaining because actually his memoirs, he's critical of the Polish commanders as the British, dear God. Um, but yeah, he's, he's kind of, you know, is very much again seen as the victim of the duplicitous Brits. Um, and I think there's still one of the difficulties in, in doing in doing Polish history in the Second World War is there is still so much hurts and the, the impact is still felt on families, whether in Britain, whether in Poland, um, and trying to escape all of that is very difficult. So, um, and a lot of it comes from the post-communist, you know, the fall where, for example, the Warsaw Uprising wasn't a major celebration to the same, sorry, not celebration, commemoration to the same degree as it was once communism falls. So you're kind of rediscovering myths and giving them new life. Um, so you've got this sort of, that's continuing um, as well to sort of, you know, which kind of stifles criticism when we're talking about, you know, sort of the mythology and, and so forth. So it's still something that's very much sort of being fought over. And so you've obviously got, you know, what actually happens on the ground. You've got the rewriting of history and the sort of the memoirs in the sort of 60s and 70s. And then you've got what happens once the Poles are free um, mm. from communism to actually delve back into their own history and to, to make their own sort of, um, you know, and, and research what actually happened um, away from the sort of Soviet lies and, and so forth. I think, I think you make a very good point about the sense of betrayal, because to me, betrayal is a very long lasting emotion. Mag and I went to a lecture on Friday uh, about the Jewish population of Normandy in World War II, similar to, in fact, what MAG had been talking about on World War II TV two weeks ago. And one of the things that the presenter, Olivier, was talking about is how when he interviews family members, some of them are still claiming that they that their, 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 their families were denounced by another French family. It was that guy over there. He did. He betrayed us. And when he points out the fact, actually, no, they were just on the list. There, there, there was no denouncement. The Germans and the French... Gendarmes had you on the list. You were just in a roundup. There was no denouncement. But they, they've been holding for seven, nearly eight decades, this sense of betrayal because betrayal, as I said, is a long lasting emotion. Anger can subside quite quickly, but betrayal, very, very hard to get rid of. And when we think of what happened politically, you know, what you mentioned with the Attlee early on and how the Churchill and the Polish and everything post-war, which is a subject we could expand on at some other point, but it's kind of beyond the scope of today. But there is, and it extends to Czechoslovakia, the Czech pilots and Czech, it's, it's not just a uniquely Polish thing, but they were absolutely betrayed at Yalta. And, and Sosobowski and the Poles are um, kind of, the fact that he was a scapegoat is also comes under that betrayal heading. So, but, but that aside, 
with, with the, you know, the, Hal has, uh, Sazovsky's grandson, Hal, is, is going out and talking about his grandfather now. That's happening now. So is there a re-evaluation? Is there interest in trying to put some, um, some, some more um, an analysis, fresh analysis into the Polish role regards outside of this, this interest they have and, 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 and not interest, that's not the right word, this, this feeling of betrayal they're carrying with them? I think it's so difficult because, I mean, you talk about sort of Hal Sosbowski or Alina's great-grandfather, for example, um, or I think about my my grandfather, and we're all still caught up in this. And, and actually sort of separating the history from the family, I think, is so important, um, particularly, you know, for a trained historian. Um, so I think what we're looking at is it's very difficult. I mean, as, as historians, the idea that we should be objective I, I think past a few decades back that we bring our strengths our insights um our, our own you know sort of background to bear and to provide that insight and that's the position of, of strength um that, that makes you asking these you know important questions um but it we can't escape the fact that this lingers and it shapes the polish community um i was you know as rena you know uh, article um, Olivia Smith wrote about, you know, her grandfather's experience during the war and, and this farm that's in the family. And I can't draw on that. You know, our, our land was taken um, first in the Russian Revolution, then any wealth and status the family had, and, and you know, was taken in the Second World War and began from scratch. Um, I was thinking about my own wedding, for example, I and mean, we made a joke that it was kind of a widow's convention. There were no older men, but you're operating cut off from that community and network and all of those support structures that allow you to proceed in, in life. So um, it's very, very difficult to start from scratch in post-war Britain. And although many, many people did make successes, that sense that that sacrifice that the British, that the Poles had made, um, and then to be betrayed at Yalta, and then to be insulted and looked down on in the workplace and then for the struggles that their families had at school and to sort of even you know rippling into the third fourth generation is really really powerful um so yeah when you talk about you know the anger subsides i'm not actually sure it does quite frankly um but yes yeah, this sort of it, it it is something that i think when we're talking about broadening our understanding of the Second World War, um, not just the Poles, the other exiled armies, but the Poles particularly because they make up this huge post-war community. Um, that is lived experience that, that continues to shape us. And I know this talk um, about, you know, the Brits are obsessed with the Second World War and, and quite right too, it was a major formative event for many, many people's families. Um, and I think we should continue to bait the role it plays in, in our identity and then how we understand our country. Well, you know, it's still affecting everything. We, there's so many political decisions around the world are still still largely based on events that are happening 77 years of which. But I'm thinking now that what we're coming back to is where we started this, which is this idea of understanding history from different points of view. Because I have been able to look at the Polish role at Arnhem, but but without but the bookends being September the 17th to kind of September the 28th or something. It's it's have what you've done is come at it from this longer term look at taking from the 19th century through the 20th century to the First World War to the interwar years to the World War II experience to the betrayal at Yalta to, to the to the the communist era to all that which gives you uh, the 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 context to then examine the market garden within this greater history and that is why again it's so important to have a wide range of voices studying something like our market garden because that larger area of the Polish story isn't to me integral to understanding this small part of the Polish story is understanding the bigger story around it. And therefore that's the the whole reason why we have these conversations. So, you know, we, what the point is we're, we're, we we've, as we said earlier, there are people who really only know this story from the Gene Hackman portrayal in the film with his, his general Browning business and the, and the checking the, the RAF guys, got the right uniform just checking you're on our side that kind of thing which are great moments and and he, he he's for his limited appearance in the film he does he does make sure the eyes are on him whether you like his portrayal or not you kind of when he's in the room with him, are those big hitters and ryan o'neill and sean connor your eyes go to gene hackman you go to the po to the polish figure there so um yeah people are saying you're talking about this the 
what a great show it's been. But to, to, to sum things up, so um, where, where are you in your understanding of the Polish role at Arnhem? Because I know it's not your main that you've kind of done this as a favor to me because I was doing Arnhem. Your, your, your interests are much more varied and it's the Polish experience in the UK and our, and the Polish pilots and, 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 the, and the armor division. But where, 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 what's next for you to learn about the Polish at Arnhem? Um, I really, I mean, I, I sort of scouted around this because I really do want to look much closer at the British perspective. I've come at it from what was the experience that the Poles brought up to arriving um, in sort of 1944. Um, but I know, for example, Alan Manson takes Montgomery's judgment of, um, you know, of Sosabowski, um, and, and he kind of wants me to challenge it. So I really do want to gain a real understanding of that role um, beyond the Polish perspective. So I, I think that's where I need to go with it. And um, because it does tie into all the questions we're talking about, about integration and command structures and so forth. And as you say, you keep sort of, you know, bringing up this morale idea um, related to the Warsaw Uprising. Could the Poles have done more? Um, and certainly there's nothing you ever read in the Polish, that, you know, that suggests that the Poles slack off in their military efforts throughout. I mean, when Maciek has the opportunity to sort of, you know, rest after Hill 262, for example, he says, absolutely not the warsaw uprising is going how can we be sort of having a break while you know people are dying in the streets of warsaw um you know and when you know all the other armies everything is going to be easier after this they will pick up the laurels they will take glory the poles need to be be at that so it would be incredibly surprising i would say to find out that, that you know uh the poles at arnhem aren't as cooperative um aren't as driven as they are in every other sphere that, that I've studied. I mean, I think this is one of the things, I mean, we'll, we'll end things in a minute, but in my readings about the American forces and the, and the British, I think, sadly, everyone has an opinion about the Polish role, whether they've actually investigated it or, it, or not. Um, and they, they'll, they'll make a comment and you go, have you have you read about this? Have you have you have you just kind of heard that from someone else and repeating something you've heard as well? And I think there has been a tendency just to dismiss or take what other people have said and say, well, that this person, this author, this historian, this person who was there said this about the polls. I'll just say that in there as well. They don't get much of a look in in Cornelius Ryan's book, really. They don't get much of a look in it in some of the, some of the, the the wider books about it. And and maybe that's well, not maybe that needs to change their their role. It's it's the thing is by the time the poles get involved in the crossing of the river and what have you, the the battle is kind of sealed by this point. There's they're coming into it beyond a point where there's any difference they can really make. The mistakes have been made earlier on that that they're, they're not going to be able to change it on whether or not they do their role better or worse. It's it's already the dice that die has been cast by them, but they are doing they do do their bit. And just just to finish off as well, what what did happen? Um, to the the brigade after, and we talked about 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 Sosabowski himself. But what happened to the brigade? Just to, for those who don't know, um, so they sort of uh, remain behind on sort of occupation duties, and then um, when we get to the end of the war, that's the choice, isn't it? Do you return to communist occupied Poland? Do you return to to Britain? Um, you know, those that return to particularly officers that return um, to, to communist occupied Poland, um, you know, quite often, uh, uh, you know, certainly imprisoned, interrogated and, and so forth. And those who, you know, return to sort of Britain, maybe try to pick up in Scotland, but the Scottish Union is much more hostile, there's more job opportunities in England. So it's a little bit like starting afresh. You might try to look if you're, you know, I've seen a few sort of references to, well, why not go elsewhere in the world? Well, actually, no, because, the, you know, countries are quite choosy. So although Canada is encouraging emigration, they want single healthy men. Um, New Zealand, very similar. So if you've got a family, if you're that bit older, that opportunity isn't there for you. And um, so a lot of the time it is about making the best of the deal in a country that's made it pretty damn clear they don't want you. Yeah. And we just had a question about what the uh, the Polish losses were, Diana. And I have to say, I don't I don't know that figure myself. Do you Do you know that figure, Jenny? Oh, say that again. I missed that. What were the Polish losses at Arnhem? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, all I've seen is that you know they were significantly smaller than the other units, but that would make sense, really, given that in that kind of holding position there. Um, I'm not sure. I'm afraid. 
No, I, I don't know either, but, but I, I don't think it in many ways. So apologies for not knowing the answer, but it's it's kind of in some ways out of the context of what we're I talking mean, about. But If I could just make a last point. I mean, one of the, the nicer features of the Arnhem um, element is the remembrance by the Dutch people. Um, so, for example, you've got um, this, this woman, Cora, who comes and helps um, and, and explains that the bridge has been taken and the ferries destroyed and, and, and so forth. Um, and then she lobbies really, really hard um, in the sort of 60s, 70s um, onwards um, for the Dutch to commemorate the, the poles on the same level um, and to sort of, you know, really restore their reputation. So she plays this really crucial role. Um, having, you know, spoken to Sospovsky directly um, is sort of rehabilitating them. And um, so the Dutch do a bloody good job of actually playing sort of due tribute, um, you know. Yeah. The oh, I, I, when you go to the Driel area, there is lots there about the Polish in involvement. There are there are equal numbers of monuments there, if, if not maybe more monuments there, the Polish side of things, as there are to the British in Arnhem. And because and, and, you're, you're in the same area where you go a bit south, you're into where the Americans were in the, in the island in, in, in October 44. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff about the Polish there, and they certainly have been remembered in that aspect of it, which is very good. But um, well, well, we will bring things to an end. I'll just remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say good, goodbye in a second. So tomorrow, uh, there's the live show, same time, 7 p.m. UK. John Sliz is joining me to talk about the role of engineers in the Battle of Market Garden, particularly the garden side of it. So the, the units attached to 30 core. We could talk about Bailey bridges, pontoon bridges, uh, boats, river crossings, the use of river uh, boats, and basically the where engineers sat in the market garden plan i will also hopefully tomorrow maybe later tonight depending on how much work i do upload the finished edited uh, interview i did with rg poulison about where market garden went wrong in the point of view of his research into the 82nd nymeg and that i'm halfway through editing hell of that it's taken me too many hours today but i'll try and get that either finished tonight or tomorrow so with two shows and then We've got two uh, Wednesday night. Of course, we've got Dr. Phil Blood coming on talking about his new book about the Luftwaffe and the uh, war crimes and what have you in Ukraine. That'd be fantastic. And then Friday, Dilip Sarkar is joining us for the human tragedy to sum up Arnhem Week with some personal stories of those who fell in the battle. So lots of things coming up. As usual, folks, don't forget to check us out on Twitter, Patreon, Facebook. Don't forget to check out Jenny on Twitter, Science in Polish, because lots of Polish uh, history coming your way from that. But right now, it remains thank uh, me to say thank you very much to Jenny for joining us. Your yeah. cough didn't inhibit you too much in the end. I, I, I clearly sacrificed the right chickens to the right deities. That was good. That's it. Yeah, good, 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 good goat sacrifice there. But um, that was good. So um, that's well, thank you very much for joining us. As you know, you're always welcome to come back because people love your insight. They love your, 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 the, the, the focus you come at from, from being Polish. And so we all look with, interest in your forthcoming whatever it is you're working on and your the number of lectures and podcasts and appearances you're doing now it's incredible as i said on twitter the other day, i like to say i knew you before you were a global podcasting sensation so it's you know it's it's good that for you for people who are interested in polish history it's good that you that, that you found a platform for this because it's 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 cool to get this across so it's fantastic so well, thank you very much for joining us. So this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying thank you very much for your company. We will see you all again tomorrow. Good, good afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.